Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Association of Former Students at Texas A&M uh, Homebuyer Workshop. My name is Jason Maida. It's great to be with everyone uh, this evening, or maybe even afternoon, depending on where you're at in, in the country. Um, so it's really exciting to get a chance to, to join you uh, today to be able to kind of share with you a little bit more about what home buying looks like. Uh, we have an exciting partnership with the Association of Former Students uh, at Texas A&M, and so we're really excited to be able to bring this content to you. This is our second installment of uh, four workshops that we offer throughout 2024. Um, so if this is something that you're, you know, uh, really enjoying the content and you think maybe friends or family, maybe some coworkers or maybe some fellow alum might enjoy, we'd encourage them to maybe check out our recorded version of tonight's class or they can check in, check out the third or fourth installments that'll be available later in this year. Well, um, this is a very interactive session that we provide to you. So as we go through tonight's session, I really encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we'll be kind of managing the questions for through both the Q&A um, function and uh, the chat function within Zoom. Uh, my colleague, Ken Fleck, will be helping me um, you know, with our uh, question answering. We have a, a pretty large audience for tonight. I think we had over 300 signups for tonight's class. So really excited that you can get a chance to spend a little bit of your time with us this evening. Um, and when I when I launch into our classes, I'm always kind of interested to see like where some of our guests are joining us from. So if you have a minute, just drop in the chat what part of the country you're in. I know probably most of us are in the Texas market, but I'd love to know, you know, where you're at. Um, and I think that really helps me to help as I kind of go through market discussions, like we'll talk a little bit about the housing market and interest rates, but specifically to the housing market, you know, the cost of homes look different all across the country, right? So to be able to get a sense of where you're joining us from is super helpful for me. So I appreciate that. Um, and you guys have already dropped some stuff in the chat. That's very cool. I see some Tennessee there. I see Texas, New Mexico, Florida. Awesome. Virginia, Houston. Awesome. That's in British Columbia, um, international in, in South America. Okay, cool. This is this is great. The power of technology that we can get a chance to be able to share this content everywhere. It's really cool. So, uh, and I I saw Nashville, El Paso, Arizona. Very cool. So, even kind of more validation why I asked the question of like where are we joining us from? Because if I just focus just on Texas. Um, analytics or metrics to housing that wouldn't really be helpful for a lot of you. So, um, so I'm glad you got a chance to drop that in the chat. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, and dive in. And I just want to kind of share with you a little bit about American Pacific Mortgage and myself. So we're excited to be in our first year of of a partnership. Um, with the association. And, um, you know, like I said, we are getting a chance to broadcast these four workshops throughout the year. Uh, we have a, a three-year agreement with the association and we'll continue to want to extend our, our resources and tools to the association to help improve your, you know, kind of chances or your probability of homeownership at some point. Um, American Pacific Mortgage is a leading lender. Uh, we're a top 10 lender in the country. Uh, we're nationwide. Uh, my particular team uh, focuses in on home buyer education, and we help kind of nurture our partnerships across the country. Um, beyond our Texas A&M relationship, we also work with other universities across uh, the country. Um, although, you know, Texas A&M is one of our favorites, so we're really excited at this, at this uh, chance to be able to share this information with you. Um, our classes primarily focus in on first-time buyer resources, but you could still be a second or third-time buyer and join us for one of these classes. I think it's never too uh, late to learn some of these like key concepts that you'll hear today. Speaking of those concepts, so let's talk a little bit about today's agenda. So we're going to look at the housing market, like we kind of just talked about in uh, sharing with where you're joining us from. We'll talk about um, the interest rate market, um, and there's a lot to talk about, and we can unpack of quite a few things there because I think probably 70 or 80 percent of my day in working with clients is spent discussing interest rates. Uh, we're going to do a rent versus buying calculator exercise in just a few minutes. I also want to then kind of transition into credit. I want to kind of give you some housekeeping things, if you will, for credit to help you on that path towards home ownership. We'll spend some time looking at student loans. I want to discuss loan programs with you that might fit for you in your home buying plan. We'll also talk about doc documentation needed. Um, if you decide to build a home buying plan with us, like what kind of proof of income or assets you would need to gather. So what are kind of some of my action items lists? And then we'll talk about first time buyer programs that could be available to you depending on what state uh, you decide to purchase in. And then finally, I wanna take you through the buying process. So after, after attending tonight's class, 
you may say, Jason, what are my next action items or what's my next steps in the process? Well, I'm going to walk you through a workflow of buying. And that doesn't mean you have to run out and buy a house this weekend. It's just we want you to understand when you do take those next steps in home ownership, what it could look like for you. All right. And again, use the chat or um, or Q&A function in, in Zoom. We'll be kind of managing those uh, questions or monitoring, I should say, those questions. And we'll try to do our best to answer those on air. Um, final housekeeping note before we launch, um, this uh, class is being recorded. Um, so if you, you missed something, this will be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. We're also going to send out the entire presentation to those of you that um, have signed up for the class. So as long as we have your email on, on, um, on uh, site, then we'll go ahead and get that out to you tomorrow morning. All right. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump in. And we'll first talk a little bit about the benefits of buying a home. Cause I think as my clients are kind of thinking about what should I continue to rent or should I buy? And you know, what's my budget look like? I think we, we sometimes forget some of the benefits that come along with buying and not, you know, obviously we want the nice house and, and all that stuff, but I think there's some things we want to think through a little bit like budget wise. Right. So when I compare renting versus buying, it doesn't necessarily look the same because we want to take into consideration all the great things that come along with owning a home, not just having the, the, the nice yard with grass in the front. Right. It's, it's thinking about like, can I control my budget now? Do I have stability in my housing payment? Um, is there ability to be able to see my home grow in value? The difference between what my home is worth versus what the balance is, that's called home equity. So that allows me to create more wealth, hopefully generational wealth over time. And there still is some tax benefits, believe it or not, with owning versus renting. So you can potentially still deduct interest. Of course, we would encourage you to talk to your tax advisor about that. But those are opportunities with owning versus renting. And so, you know, if you're paying $2,000 in, in rent, but you are kind of struggling with the idea of jumping to a $2,500 mortgage payment, when you factor in some of those benefits, it may not look as daunting as a task for you. And I think to help you with that kind of launch into consider home ownership, I always teach our classes about around a, um, a budgeting tool. And we call it our rent versus buying calculator. And so I want to spend just a few minutes looking at this calculator. And, and as I just mentioned to you, we're going to send out all the presentation material to you tomorrow morning, uh, including the links to this calculator. But I thought it might be helpful to take our class as kind of a starting point through this budgeting exercise. And I do realize since we're all in different parts of the country, some of the numbers I've already kind of pre-filled for our class may not be relevant for where you're at. If you're in California and you may look at this purchase price of 450,000, say not even close, or you may be in you know, a different part of Texas that's maybe at a, a lower priced um, market, then, then maybe you're looking at more 300,000. So I would encourage you when you have time Take a look at this link. You can go ahead and do your own calculations, but I want to give you kind of the the logic behind the the formulas and kind of what we're what we're looking at here and the different inputs. So the way this calculation works, and you can kind of see on screen, we're going to first start. I'm going to do this drop down here. It starts with renting, so we're going to plug in our renting uh, amount. So whatever we're currently paying right now. So in this particular client scenario, we put twenty five hundred dollars as rent. We assumed renter's insurance at fifteen dollars a month. And then we project our rents to increase maybe 5% on an annual basis. So that's on the rental tab. And then when we drop into the home, home purchase side of things, we have a $450,000 purchase price. Um, we're going to learn about loan programs and minimum down payments in just a few minutes. But the minimum down payment as a first-time buyer using a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac conventional loan product is 3%. Um, we factor in property taxes, um, and property taxes will vary. If you're buying in Texas, those those property taxes might look different than, say, buying in California or Arizona. Um, but we use kind of as a general baseline, 1.25% of the purchase price usually. But, you know, if we're buying in certain parts of Texas, that could be 2.4%. So we'll just kind of put a, a, a placeholder here of a, of a what-if property taxes. We have homeowner's insurance that's estimated. Um, we have maintenance costs for our home because certainly when we buy our house, right, we're going to have to think about the, the repairs that might need to be done at some point in time. So we want to budget for that. From a finance perspective, you can see we have the term here. We have a 30-year fixed mortgage. 99% of our first-time buyers are going to elect a 30-year fixed mortgage. Why do we do that? Well, because the payments are generally the lowest on a 30-year fixed mortgage because those payments are spread out over 30 years versus, let's say, a 15-year loan or maybe a 20-year loan. 
Um, we have uh, um, interest rates that uh, a buyer is looking at. We're going to talk a little bit about interest rates in just a little bit. We have origination charges. So that's what a lender will charge you for your closing costs to purchase your home and use those financing resources. Now, in our partnership with the association, we actually discount our origination charges to try to help give you one of the most competitive options in the marketplace. So we actually lower our origination cost by $750 and really try to help get you the best available interest rate whenever you decide to take those next steps. Um, and then finally, we have discount points, which gives you the ability as a buyer to put additional costs out of pocket to bring down your interest rate. Um, you may hear that as you're doing your searches online um, for financing options. Usually what a discount point looks like is that a discount point is 1% of your total loan amount. And that 1% of your loan amount that you pay in out of pocket at cost will generally reduce down your interest rate on your mortgage by about a quarter percent. Okay, so that's what that looks like. In today's market, which we're going to talk about interest rates in just a bit, it doesn't make a lot of sense to invest that kind of cash into bringing down your interest rate. Most of our buyers purchasing in 2024, uh, even those that purchased in 2023, are probably going to be looking at refinancing in the next couple of years. The break even on those discount point investments just don't make a lot of sense in today's market. Um, and then we have other settlement services. Those are what we call as closing costs. Those can be for attorney's fees to buy your house, title, escrow fees, transfer taxes to the county that you're going to purchase in, a variety of different things that will be in that section. And then finally, we have other assumptions. In our home buying scenario, we're assuming that our home could appreciate uh, 4% on an annual basis. So pretty realistic. Um you know, we depends on what the market does, of course. We have expected years in the home and why that's important. We're saying we're going to buy this house and keep it for at least seven years. We have the selling cost of our home. We have the state and, and federal tax rates that we want to factor into our equation for the potential tax deductibility. And finally, we want to compare that to what savings rates are being offered at this time. So if we were to side by side comparison, my calculator of renting versus buying, you can see, of course, from a, a rent perspective, we know that's going to be cheaper, especially in today's higher elevated interest rate market. We compare that to the buy side. We have a $2,500 payment versus somewhere around $3,800 or so on the buy side. So clearly a, a, an increase, right? To my point earlier, though, we want to factor in the benefits still towards home ownership, even in this current interest rate market. Do I have the ability to control my budget? Do I have the potential tax deductibility? And the biggest thing is, my equity appreciation over that course of seven years, which ultimately leads to a savings of about $79,000 of owning a home versus was buying. Now, as I consult with clients or I have, you know, calls that come in that, you know, clients or, or prospective clients want to say, hey, in fact, I got a call today, is now the right time to buy? I think that is a decision that each buyer is going to have to kind of process for themselves. I think there are opportunities in today's market, given the elevated environment, not all buyers can be able to get into the market because of interest rates and limited purchasing power. Interest rates, like everything in housing markets, will cycle. Generally, housing markets cycle about every 10 years. Um, I think what's important in today's market, if you can afford to enter the market, is the price point that you enter versus what the interest rate you achieve, because we'll talk about interest rates in just a second, but that price point of home is really important. And so if we were to look at the national average on the median price of home, we're, you know, we're right around that 440 range, if we were to look across all markets. And, you know, that that trend is for prices to potentially go up. And that's not exclusive to a particular market in, in the States. You know, you could look at a Texas market with a two to 3% increase or an Arizona market that could see a six or 7% increase or California that could be two to 3%. Um, and so a lot of what we're seeing in the housing market is driven on the lack of inventory for buyers. And so there's only so many homes available, both on the resale market and on the new home market. If there's a certain level of buyer demand out there, and just not enough supply to support the buyer demand, something has to change. And so ultimately what generally changes, especially in today's market, is we're starting to see prices rise a little bit. 
And so that's what I think we need to be aware of as buyers is that what does this housing market look like for me? Because, you know, that is going to be the challenge is the cost of housing. Um, in fact, as we kind of transition into interest rates, there is a report that came out today called the Consumer Price Index Report, which measures inflation. Well, costs of goods are are coming down for us as, as a community, but the cost of housing continues to rise. And obviously interest rates are a big role in that or the cost of rent. And so, you know, something has to change from that perspective. But, you know, when we're looking at kind of the cost of financing, interest rates are going to drive that, right? And so we're starting to see some good trends across the market where interest rates are starting to come down. In fact, this this chart kind of shows a nice little reflection of that. We love to see downward pressure on interest rates, obviously. Um, this is the last 12 month snapshot. So this could kind of looks like a little bit of a roller coaster ride, right? So we kind of went up the mountain and came down and we're kind of like bumping along. And then we had a nice little jump off here recently. Last Monday, we hit interest rates that equivalent were equivalent to April of 2023 interest rates. A lot of that was because of the challenges in the Japan uh, financial markets. That was last Monday. Those markets have recovered a little bit. So we're now kind of like bouncing around. I mentioned that consumer price index report earlier, um, and ultimately that is measuring inflation. And why we're here in this current state of interest rates is because the Federal Reserve has tried to combat inflation by ratcheting up the federal funds rate. Well, now we're seeing inflation starting to soften, but there is talks that maybe we've slowed the economy a little bit too much. So there is the, the recession word starting to float around in, um, in conversations. And so, you know, unfortunately, that's not good for growth of our economy. But it also means recession could mean lower interest rates, which obviously would now would fuel higher housing demand because now you'll see more buyers re-entering the market. So what's going on with interest rates will be really driving a lot of what we see in prices, I think, for homes. Um, you know, there's already talk about it right now. We've seen a lot of demand in July and August for buyers. Um, before we transition off of interest rates, I just want to let everyone know, because you're, you're going to see this on whatever news outlet you tune into, the Federal Reserve is going to make a decision on the, the, the kind of the change of the federal funds rate next month. So there's a big meeting that, you know, speculation is they're going to cut the federal funds rate maybe a half a percent. Um, there's kind of a misconception on what that means for interest rates. A lot of people say, hey, they're going to cut rates a half a percent, so mortgage rates are going to go down a half a percent. Well, that's not necessarily the case because it's not a one-to-one -one ratio with, with those rates. A lot of what you're going to see with interest rates in the mortgage space um, will kind of lead up to that Federal uh, Reserve meeting in mid-September. So we'll probably see the markets come down if there's kind of a really good um, uh, hint that they are going to bring rates down. So, you know, you might see federal or sorry, news outlets saying, hey, the, the Federal Reserve is dropping rates, so mortgage rates are going to drop. And that's just not necessarily, necessarily the way the market works. Um, I'm going to take a quick question before we kind of talk about characteristics and interest rates, which is um, if uh, we have a client that owns land, um, what options are available uh, to build? So construction financing, we can talk more about this in loan programs. Construction financing is a little bit challenging in today's market, um, given the level of interest rates and the risk involved with construction financing. There's not a lot out there. Um, for that question, if you want to kind of connect with me offline, we can kind of talk about maybe some boutique resources that are out there, but construction financing can be a little bit tough in today's market. Um, what goes into an interest rates are a few different factors. Um, so it's not a one size fits all with interest rates. Credit eligibility plays a role, the type of product you're using, how much you decide to finance, what your down payment looks like. Um, we talked about it earlier about discount points. If you want to bring down your interest rate with more out-of-pocket expense, that can change your interest rate. And then the term of my loan. Generally speaking, the shorter I bring my term in on my loan, the lesser my interest rate will be. Now, as we meet with you to discuss options for you, and I always you'll hear me reference the home buying plan because that's really the plan of goals and objectives for home ownership. We're going to kind of figure out which program and rate selection works best for you. But Interest rates generally are not secured until you have an accepted offer with a seller. So generally the market's going to be moving along as you're doing your home searching. But once you have an accepted offer with a seller, then we engage at locking in your interest rate. All right. 
Let's talk a little bit about credit. And when I think about all the clients that we kind of counsel in home ownership, there's can't be two challenges to achieving home ownership. One could be maybe my savings isn't to where I want it to be. And we'll talk about that later. But more often than not, it could be on the credit side because maybe we're a little overextended or maybe there's something that appeared on our credit report that we just weren't really aware of. So in our classes, we like to help educate you on what's in credit and what's the model look like and just some kind of tools that you can use to implement yourself. So on screen, you can see here this FICO score calculation. This is kind of the weighting of credit scores. 15% is going to be how long have I had credit active? So how long is my credit or mature my, my credit file is? 20% is going to be how much new credit am I trying to open? So you've probably heard of inquiries of credit. Um, that is impacted at 20% of your credit score. Um, now, I think it's important to know that there's two types of inquiries. There's a hard inquiry, which will impact your score, and there's a soft inquiry. Now, in our process for designing home buying options to have a client pre-approved, we only start with a soft inquiry. The reason why our team does that is because many of our first-time buyers are not ready to buy like right now. Um, it could be next year. It could be three or four months from now. And so we don't want to put that impact in your score. So we can still render credit decisions without having to do a, a full inquiry. The other part of the 20% component is new accounts. So if I'm opening up a lot of new accounts, especially in the most recent 12 to 18 months, that could negatively impact my credit score. 30% is going to be around revolving credit. So if you have a credit card or a line of credit, overdraft protection, whatever that might be, the 30% component is looking at your credit limits versus your credit balances. So ideally, you want to be at 10% or less of the percentage of balances to credit limits. If you're you know, hovering around 60 or 70% utilization of credit, then I would encourage you to try to manage to get below 50% as kind of your starting baseline, and then try to do your best to whittle down to at least 10% utilization of credit. Now, um, quick homework assignment for our class, um, really simple thing to do. I would encourage you to take one of your credit card statements out this evening or tomorrow. Take a look at two dates that you'll see on that statement. One is your billing cycle date or your closing date for your credit card. The other is your due date. I just want to bring your attention to this billing cycle date because that's the date the credit card issuer sends out information to the credit agencies. And then the due date is when you make your payment. One thing I would change up if, you, if you're in the habit of paying on your due date, which there's nothing wrong with that, but if you're trying to kind of elevate your credit score, especially if you're getting ready to apply for something, try to pay down your credit cards before the end of the billing cycle or closing date. Because if you can catch it before the, the credit issuer sends out information to the credit agencies, then you're going to lift that credit score and have a better look. And that FICO score can obviously improve your interest rate offering, which we've already talked a little bit about, and it could impact the product offering as well, too. The last component is payment history. So that's pretty self-explanatory. How have I paid my bills, right? Um, if you've had any late payment challenges, they'll be rated as 30-day lates. 60 day lates and 90 day delinquencies. So the more severe my delinquency is, the higher impact I'm gonna to have to my credit score. Just keep in mind that we're looking at events in the most recent 12 to 24 months really impacting the score. Now, if you've had something that's six or seven years ago, at seven years, that might even fall off your credit report, but especially in the most recent 12 to 24 months, it's really gonna help, or it's not really gonna hurt the credit score, I should say. Now, every loan program has a minimum credit score, and we have the, some of those on the screen here. And we're going to talk about programs in just a second, but just keep that in mind. So depending on where you're at credit score-wise, that could dictate which direction you decide to go from a, a loan um, program perspective. Um, now, in evaluating options for clients, we do look at all three credit agencies. So you guys probably know these. They're Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, right? Now, we take the middle credit score of all three agencies. And so, for example, if I'm a client and my top score is 750, my middle score is 720, my lowest score is 700, well, in this case, the middle score is 720. And so that'll be used to evaluate my product offering, my interest rate, even my mortgage insurance to purchase my home. Now, if I have a partner that's going to join me in my application, and maybe my partner scores a little bit lower than mine, maybe they're at 700, 680, and 660, 
From a lending perspective, I do have to take the lowest middle score between both borrowers. So in this case, that would be 680 because my partner score is slightly lower than mine. So just something to be aware of. Um, that question comes up quite a bit as we consult with clients. And so um, it's always kind of helpful to understand, you know, how those um, reports are viewed. Now, every agency has a different risk scorecard. So meaning your score is going to look different on Equifax than Experian or TransUnion because they're looking at different metrics um, when it comes to evaluating the risk or and the assessment of your scorecard or your score, um, your score for those agencies. Um, last thing I want to leave you with on this page is account closure. Um, in fact, we had a client we were working with earlier today and they inadvertently closed out a credit limit on one of their credit cards. That's something you want to be careful with, because even though you may not want the temptation of using that credit card, once you close out that credit card, it does two things. One is it takes all the history out of the credit agency's score. And so that's going to impact your length of credit, especially if it's a longstanding account, but it also takes another credit line out of the utilization metric. So you want to be careful with closing out accounts that can actually negatively impact your score. This is a matrix that shows you how long negative items will stay with you on your credit report. I kind of mentioned it earlier on late payments. They'll be on your credit report for at least seven years, um, but they, and they of course would fall off um, after that time. And like public records will look a little bit different depending on what that particular account is. I wanna talk briefly about student loans because um, obviously there's, there's legislative uh, bills that have been passed about uh, student loan forgiveness. Um, and I think it's important to understand as a prospective buyer, like how does that impact me? So if you have student loan forgiveness, once you have that forgiveness, then those balances will get taken out of the calculation that we use from a lending perspective. Um, if you're in forbearance right now, or maybe you're going working on your master's program and you're back in school, so now you have a deferment, we still have to count a minimum payment for qualifying when it comes to student loans. Um, now there's different ways you can pre, uh, repay your student loans, like the income-based repayment program. Um, I gave you an example on screen here for a client that let's say had $75,000 in debt and they had a $250 repayment program. Well, that 250 would be what we use to qualify the client for their financing. Now, at the, on the other side of it, if I'm back in school, but I still really want to apply for a home mortgage, I still have to, as a lender, count a minimum payment for qualifying, even though you're in deferment or maybe forbearance. So if we use a Fannie Mae conventional loan, the default is 1% of the balance that gets counted as the payment. So that would be, for this example, for this client would be $750. If it's an FHA loan, it's usually 0.5%, which is $375. So, you know, I, I think it's important as a prospective buyer to understand those calculations because, you know, as balances stay with you, maybe, and you don't have forgiveness of the debt, we want to make sure that we get those factored into the qualifying. All right, I'm going to take a quick pause before we go into loan programs. Is there any questions I can help answer from the audience here before we talk about loan programs that are offered to you as, as prospective buyers? All right, we're okay. Let me just make sure we're good. Um, I see a couple of questions further down the chat. Let me just kind of just take a quick glance. Um, so let me answer a quick question on around credit cards. So the question is, um, how do we choose which credit cards we can close and at which time in the cycle? So I wouldn't say go in and close credit cards out. I would just say take a look at those credit cards um, to see how long you've had them. Um, if there's a reasoning for closing the credit cards, like you just don't want to pay the annual fee or something, just be strategic in how you do that. Because if you took the account that you had for 10 years, maybe as a student visa that's now grown into one of your more established accounts, you would want to be careful before you start, you know, eliminating that or closing out that card. Um, okay. And then... Um, does it help to pay off student loan debt before buying a home? Not necessarily. Um, you know, it just really depends. Everybody's situation is a little bit different. I encourage clients to meet with us first before you do anything with paying off debt, because I really like to get strategic with that. Like whether it's you know trying to pay down credit card debt or student loan debt, we want to make sure that that's the right move for you. Um, and then, is there a way to get uh, a copy of um, a student loan info? Is there a way? I'm gonna have to can go and answer that one. I'm not sure what that question is for there. Um, okay, we got that. Do you... 
Okay, and then the question is, do you um, do you lean more towards higher down payment or less? If I can afford 50% down payment, what do you recommend? So I think everybody's situation is a little bit different with down payments. Um, you know, I think it really comes down to their monthly budget and what they can afford. And at the same time, is the down payment going to completely liquidate all assets? Um, so I think there's a little bit of a balancing act to that. Um, and so that's something, again, we would talk about in more of a consultation format because we'll help build a home buying plan and see if it's 50% that's the right number or 20% or 10%, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, okay. And, okay. Last thing I want to just talk about, on, and then we're going to go to loan programs so we can keep us on track for timing. Does downgrading a credit card affect the credit score? So I think downgrading means maybe lowering your credit limit. Um, so that could depend upon what your outstanding balance looks like. So it could impact your utilization depending on the other balances. And last thing, um, and then we'll go into the programs. Um, the question came in the chat, is there a consultation fee to meet with us? Absolutely not. So that's a free service we provide to help educate you and provide your own like customized home buying plan. So good question. We'll talk more about that later. Um, okay, um, so let's talk about loan programs. So we spotlighted five kind of programs. I would say for most of our attendees in our classes across the country, we're probably gonna be focusing more on conventional and FHA and to a certain extent, the VA uh, home loan product. But I wanna give you kind of a high level look at each one of these products. So you kind of, you've probably heard about them before, but let's, let's kind of dive in a little bit closer. Conventional loans, when you think about a conventional loan, it's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. It does have a minimum down payment for first-time buyers at 3% of the sales price. Now, for those of you um, that are in high cost of living markets, I think we have somebody from Virginia, I think what California is representing too. If you go beyond 766550, which is this loan amount you can see here, um, then you come into what we call the high balance loan space, which then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac says your, in, your down payment has to go from three to 5%. But for most parts of the country, we're going to be at a 3% minimum down payment. The conventional loan does have a minimum credit score of 620. Um, so that's what that'll look like for that qualifying level. Um, and then for the conventional product, it usually is about 70% of all originations across the country, meaning 70% of most buyers are going to be using the conventional product. But I think it's important to understand not every buyer will qualify for conventional. So that's why we have other alternatives to offer buyers like the FHA product. The FHA loan stands for the Federal Housing Administration. So it is a government insured product and it's insured because it has a little more flexibility. It's a little bit more um, risk flexible. Um, it's a minimum down payment of three and a half percent. FHA sets the maximum loan limit by county. So, you know, you may have a certain county and let's say you're in Maricopa County in Arizona, that might be a certain loan amount um, versus let's say you're in a county in Virginia, that might look a little bit different. Um, we're going to talk more about a kind of a comparison between these two products in just a minute, because when you put less than 20% down on a, kind of on a conventional loan, you do have mortgage insurance. Um, and with any down payment on an FHA loan, you have mortgage insurance. So we're going to talk about the, the characteristics of that in just a bit. The VA home loan for our veterans that have eligibility on the VA home loan, the VA product's an, an amazing product. It's a zero down payment option for the veteran. Um, it has a lot of flexibility in the underwriting, um, whether it's the obligations the veteran has. Um, we can maybe get a little bit more flexible with that. It could be the credit history for the veteran because we want to help support our veterans in home ownership. And then over to the right, we have our USDA product, which is for clients that want to purchase in like more rural areas. Um, the benefit with USDA, it's a no down payment option. Um, and the loan amounts will vary by the county. And then finally, there's a jumbo loan product. So if you're a client that needs a little bit more financing, let's say can be supported under the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, loan limits, then a client could use a jumbo loan. So, you know, it doesn't happen a lot with first time buyers, but let's say I'm in Dallas and I want to purchase a million dollar place as my first place. Well, if you put 20% down, that loan amount is $800,000, which would exceed the conventional loan limit. So in that case, a buyer would need a jumbo financing. Jumbo loans aren't very, um, it's not It's not going to be really for our first time buyers, but it can happen at times. There's higher asset requirements with jumbo loans, um, which includes what we call as reserves. So when you have reserves, it means additional money that you have set aside after you've contributed like your down payment and your closing costs. 
usually those reserves will need to at least be 12 months of the monthly payment. So if that million dollar house mortgage payment is $7,000, I'm probably gonna need like $94,000 additional in assets, okay? So again, not, not something we're probably gonna focus on too much as a first time buyer, but if we need a little bit more buying power, that's where the jumbo loan comes into play. Um, we talked a little bit about mortgage insurance, like I kind of alluded to it. So I want to kind of dive in a little bit closer with mortgage insurance, because many of you, before you attended tonight's class, maybe you've already been on Redfin or Zillow, and you're running some payment calculations. You see this place in Houston, you're like, oh, that's really cool. Um, the payment is X, and can I afford it? Um, I think it's important to know that when you hop on websites like that, and you're doing calculations, a lot of the mortgage insurances that you see there, if you're putting less than 20% down, are not necessarily accurate. Um, so let me explain why. First of all, there's different payment options that come along with mortgage insurance. So you can pay it monthly. You can pay it as a split MI where you're paying some of it up front, some of it monthly. You can take and build that into your interest rate selection, which I don't recommend. Um, and then you can just write a check for the mortgage insurance. Most clients are going to elect the monthly option. And the reason why is because most policies on, for mortgage insurance have a cancellation option. So once I reach two years in my loan and 22% equity, I can cancel the mortgage insurance. Now, um, if you were to look at your calculation on Redfin and Zillow, it's not taking into consideration some of the characteristics I'm going to go through now because mortgage insurance is not a one size fits all thing. So the higher my credit score is, the better my mortgage insurance is, the higher my down payment is, the better mortgage insurance. And then depending on the finance amount, that could change my mortgage insurance. So if I can put as much money down as possible and my credit scores are at the top tier, like 780, 800, then I'm gonna get the most affordable mortgage insurance. Think about mortgage insurance like car insurance, right? I drive a fancy car. I maybe have a lot of miles that I drive every day. Well, that insurance is probably gonna be a little bit more expensive than someone that has maybe a lesser expensive car that maybe doesn't drive as much. Mortgage insurance is very similar to that. And we have a calculation at the bottom of the screen, which you can see um, if we bought, you know, financed 450,000, I had a 3% down payment and my FICO scores were around 740. That mortgage insurance is about $183 a month. Now, one of the questions I get about mortgage insurance is, well, what is it mortgage insurance? Well, it's insurance that's required when you put less than 20% down, it insures the lender basically against default. So if something was to happen, you could make your payments. Private mortgage insurances, will co companies will come in and indemnify or protect the lender against default. Okay. Now on the FHA side of things, FHA has government insurance. So it's, it's, it's basically insured by the federal housing administration, but there are two forms of mortgage insurance with FHA. There's monthly mortgage insurance, which is 0.55% of my loan amount. There's also upfront mortgage insurance, which is 1.75% of my loan amount. So there's two components to mortgage insurance and different from conventional loans, the FHA loan does not have a mortgage insurance, uh, calcul um, sorry, cancellation option. So the only way you're going to be able to get out of mortgage insurance if you select an FHA loan is if you refinance into another product. And, and many clients in today's market that aren't quite there, maybe credit wise to qualify for conventional, will elect an FHA loan because as we mentioned earlier, some clients in the next couple of years will be looking to refinance just because it'll be a different rate uh, environment for most. Um, this is the calculation for the FHA MI. So if you took the same loan amount of $450,000, you have monthly mortgage insurance of 206, and then we have to add on this upfront mortgage insurance. So technically you're financing 457,875 when you elect an FHA loan. Now, you may kind of step back and look at these calculations and say, you know, why would I ever choose FHA over conventional? Because conventional clearly looks cheaper. It just depends because not every client we consult with will be able to um, work with a conventional product. Maybe it's credit related or maybe the, the documentation of their income. So these are other alternatives that are offered as a solution to help you achieve home ownership. But as we meet with you for your consultation, we'll kind of figure out what the right uh, resource to pull from for you in financing. All right, I know I'm behind on questions. I think Ken's helping manage some of that for me. We have such a large audience tonight. We're trying to keep up with questions. Um, so Ken, thank you for that. Um, 
So let me just uh, let me answer this question. So this will be this will be helpful for the group. So can you put down three percent to qualify for an FHA, then turn around and put down the additional seventeen percent after closing to negate the mortgage insurance, or am I better off just paying twenty percent up front? Well, FHA specific because that's your question here has a minimum down payment of three and a half percent. So you have to put a little bit more money down. Um, now, regardless if you put that money down at three and a half percent or you turn around and drop another 17 percent on top of that or 16.5 percent, your mortgage insurance is not going to go away. So you would have to refinance out of that. For a client that has that much in resources, I would want to start probably with a conventional product first to have the, the lowest um, uh, expense ratio for the financing. All right. Uh... Okay, I think we can answer this one, which is, does does PMI continue for the full length of the loan? So no, so you have a two year and 22% equity requirement on conventional loans. Then like I said, for the FHA product, we'd have to refinance out, all right? We can we can circle back more to that uh, later on in tonight's class. I wanna keep everybody on track here. Um, so let's kind of talk a little bit about documentation. So if you're thinking about getting connected with us for a consultation to design your home buying plan, I just like to kind of share with clients what we would expect to have. Like generally the last two years of W-2s, um, if you're a W-2 employee, if you're a self-employed individual, then we'll need the last two years of taxes, um, usually proof of asset statements uh, and the last 60 days of pay stubs. Um, and we could probably get away with 30 days of pay stubs if necessary. Um, so that's generally what we ask for in, in, in working with clients consultations with clients. Now, I also like to kind of comment on income because I think it's really important as your first time buyer starting this journey to really understand what is allowed in home financing because a lot of like misrepresentation of uh, what's required in financing. And the first thing is a, a two year rule. So many clients think that they have to be on their job for two years to apply for financing, which is not the case. The way the two-year rule works is that you have to show two years of work history and or educational history. So the example I'll use here, so let's say I graduated in the fall from a and &M. I started my job January 1 of 2024. Even though I spent my four years at a and and now I just started my job, I'm still eligible for financing because I have my education to support my two years. And of course I'm employed now. So that's one way of navigating through the two-year rule. We just have to show at least two years of work and or educational history. Um, so that's one thing to think about. Also job transfers. If you're you know, working at an employer for the last five years, you got a new job and you want to transfer, you can still apply um, or you want to take on that new job. We could actually even uh, in qualify you for your financing with as simple as an offer letter um, for to obtain your loan. So those are things a lot of clients don't realize. Now, where the two-year rule gets a little bit trickier is that if I have, let's say, two jobs that I work, sometimes I see this in the healthcare industry where if I have a, a client that works for two different clinics, um, maybe it's 30 hours here, 40 hours at the other, or 20 hours, whatever the case may be. In that case, I do have to show that that client has been working on both jobs simultaneously for the last two years. The last thing I'll leave you with before I take you through an income calculation is that if you have um, offline resources that uh, are part of your household, so let's say I have a partner that's bringing in income to the household and you know we split the bills or whatever the case may be, unless your partner is gonna be part of the application, then that income can't be considered for financing. All right. Questions on, on income that I can help answer. Sometimes we get some scenarios that I like to kind of like share. Uh, okay, we got one here that popped in, which is, if you had a couple months gap between jobs within the last two years, will that negatively impact you? Uh, the answer is no. So um, as long as we can document the reason for the gap, there's no issues with that. Um, so when, nothing to be worried about. If there's a major gap, like it's two or three years, maybe it's someone's re-entering the workforce, we just would want to better understand it a little bit. You know, we saw a lot of this in during the pandemic, right? You know, we had clients that were laid off for a couple of years and now re-enter the workforce in 22. Um, Totally understandable. Um, it just needs to be kind of documented. Um, okay. And and quite another question was, how does working abroad for a year affect this? So um, depends. I mean, if you're working abroad, depends on how you're, if you're paying taxes in, in the United States. Um, if you've been working abroad, now reentering the job market here in the States, I mean, that's pretty easy because we can verify through offer letters and stuff like that. Um, 
I, and I think I would probably want to know a little bit more. So if you, if you have that question, you want to kind of bring it to me offline, we can certainly have that conversation. Um, and then when determining income for two co-applicants, do you continue, uh, do you, co I'm sorry, do you com uh, combine their income or just take the highest earning applicant. So if you apply together, we blend in the income for both applicants. So good question. Um, and then another question was, so I have a client or um, actually one of our attendees is a, is a realtor here in Texas, self-employed um, and wants to kind of understand that the calculation, uh, where, or what are the lenders looking for when pre-approving pre someone who's self-employed? So when you're self-employed, obviously there's different tax structures, there's Schedule C's, there's S-Corp, there's C-Corps, there's LLC's, all that fun stuff, right? So generally we're going to average the last two years of taxable net income for a self-employed individual. So there's a full tax calculation we do for both the Fannie Mae or FHA loans um, that we'll, we would walk through. So, all right. And... And, okay, you guys have some great questions. I'm trying to keep up. I'm going to answer one more and then we'll kind of keep it moving. Um, and Ken can kind of answer the group directly. Um, and then one question is, I heard that your salary needs to be stable and not change before applying for a loan. If I'm expecting a cost of living raise next month, should I wait for that before applying for a loan? Great question. I'm glad you answered that. So you don't have to wait. Um, if we know you're getting a cost of living adjustment, we can bake that into our numbers. Um, and so that's not an issue. So we get that a lot, especially with some federal and state workers we work with across the country. So they may have a guaranteed COLA adjustment. Um, you know, that's something we can always factor into our numbers very easily. Um, one thing I want to just hit on before we move off of income and talk about a calculation of expenses. Um, if you have variable income, like let's say you get a bonus um, or you get commissions plus your base salary, in order to count the variable source of income, we do have to show that you've been on that job two years earning that type of payroll. All right, great questions. I'll, I know I'll be monitoring this a little bit more and I know Ken will address some of these questions that I might have missed. So um, bear with us here, we'll get to you. Um, so one of the calculations that lenders go through is called debt to income ratio, which looks at your monthly income versus your monthly expenses. It does take into consideration gross monthly income, so all of your pre-tax income, and then it looks at your expenses like credit cards, student loans, car payments, the expected mortgage payment, and gives us a percentage that we can't have those expenses exceed of the income. Generally, we don't want that to exceed more than 45% of your pre-tax income. And this is kind of what the calculation looks like. It's principal and interest of the mortgage, taxes for your property, insurance, homeowner's insurance for your house, if you've put less than 20% down, you would have the PMI. Uh, if you're purchasing a condo, maybe a townhouse, we have to factor in HOA expenses. And then we factor in the other debts. We divide that by your gross monthly income. And that's how we come up with this calculation of debt to income ratio. And so we have an example for you on screen. This particular client is at 35.29%, well within the underwriting guidelines. The question I get from buyers is, what should my debt to income ratio be? And I think every buyer has varying tolerance levels of debt to income ratio. I think the the comfort zone in working with hundreds of clients across the country is usually around 33 to 36%, but doesn't mean that they can't be buying comfortably at 45, even 50% that the guidelines will allow. It just depends on what kind of sourceable income a buyer has. All right, the last stop in tonight's class in kind of a building a plan, if we were to look at, you know, loan programs, credit, uh, we were to look at um, the income of our plan. We also want to talk about savings, right? And and savings for down payment and or closing costs. Um, so I want to share with you some of the documentation generally we ask for from a, a assets perspective. Um, and then I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about a savings plan, because one of the things I mentioned to you earlier in tonight's class is that there's two challenges to home ownership for most that I connect with. It could be credit or it could just be lack of resources in terms of savings. So let's we'll have some action items we can or kind of a plan we can talk about as part of our savings section in tonight's class. So this is kind of the documentation that we generally need for home buying. You know, we want to verify the last 60 days of checking in savings accounts. Cash cannot be used in a real estate transaction. Everything has to be paper trailed. Um, you can access 401, uh, 401ks or 403bs if you elect to do that. But I always encourage clients, talk to our tax or financial advisor before you um, get connected with using those assets. And family can help out with 
um, some of your resources to purchase your home. Um, that's called a gift and gift funds are absolutely allowed. Um, there is no seasoning requirement for gift funds. There's a, a documentation process to it, but it's not um, anything that's really that big of a deal. Um, now, any assets you use in a real estate transaction do have to be seasoned at least 60 days. So if you got a deposit for $10,000 and it was cash, if it was in the last 60 days, we're not gonna be able to use that because that 10,000 would have to at least be seasoned in your account at least 60 days. Now, savings can be just a challenge for clients uh, to purchase a home. And you're gonna learn a little bit more about first-time buyer programs in just a bit. But one of the things as I meet with clients for their consultations, we help develop, develop savings plans because most of our first-time buyers that come to us may have eight to 10, maybe $15,000 saved. It could be enough for their home buying plan, but may not be totally sufficient depending on what sales price they're trying to get to. So I wanna share with you a quick little exercise or discipline you can incorporate into your own finances um, to help you build that savings up. And so it's really easy and it looks like this. So if I was to say be paying $2,000 a month in rent and after meeting with Jason, I feel pretty good about having my mortgage payment be, let's say 2,500, um, I'm sorry, $3,500 a month, right? So I'm going from $2,000 a month in rent to $3,500 in mortgage. Now that's a $1,500 lift in what my budget looks like, but my income can support it. I just don't have a lot of savings resources. So what I would tell a client in that example in building a savings plan is to start saving like you're paying that $3,500 mortgage payment today. Meaning you have a $1,500 delta between those two numbers. So start, start as a discipline, taking that $1,500 and transfer it every month on the first of the month to your savings account. And by the end of six months, what do we have? We've accumulated like $9,000. By the end of the year, maybe it's $18,000. And now coupled with the other 10,000 I've saved, now I have a little bit more of a down payment. And I think it's a really simple change in discipline, but it can certainly help for you because um, it's usually not a payment issue for most of our clients. It's more of a savings issue. So if we can take the next six to 12 months to do that, it's really going to help create a better really foundation for you with your financing. All right. Now, there are first time buyer tools that are available to you in particular states as well as nationwide programs. We don't have time in tonight's class to go through each state agency program, but I will tell you there's agencies called housing financing agencies across the state that are designed to help first time buyers that are low to moderate income households. Um, they're in California, they're in Arizona, they're in Texas, they're in Tennessee, they're all spread out the, across the country. So if we get connected for a consultation, we'll share with you some of those resources as part of our plan. But nationally, Freddie Mac offers a borrow smart program, allows you to get a grant of anywhere between five to $1,500, not a lot in resources, but it can, it can help trim down closing costs. In Texas specifically, there is the My First Home program in Texas. It does allow 5% assistance for down payment and closing costs. There is a little bit of trade-off in that program because interest rates can elevate a little bit when we use that program. But you know, those are things that we can talk about during a consultation with you to see what resources we can pull from in the state that you want to buy in to help make um, uh, homeownership a little bit more affordable for you. All right, let's talk about the process of buying a house. And um, and I'm gonna, I got a few more questions in the chat, but I'm gonna kind of save those to the end because we're almost to the top of the hour. But I think it's important for our class to learn a little bit more about the buying process. So after tonight's class, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about consultations. We'd encourage you to get connected with us because that's gonna be kind of the first step in the really the buying process. Because we meet with you for a 30 minute consultation to design that plan the output of that plan would really put us on this six step of buying process, which number one is to get pre-approved. Um, and so you would have now eligibility for home buying. So you know exactly kind of what the framework of your home financing looks like, how much my sales price eligibility looks like, what my monthly payment looks like, how much my financing, what my down payment is. That comes in the form of a pre-approval certificate. That pre-approval can be used now to make offers on home when you discover a home that kind of fits all the criteria that you're looking for in a property. Now, a pre-approval is usually good for 60 days, but I always tell buyers we can always recertify that at any time because most of our buyers that are now going to start being active in the market, 
it usually takes them about three to six months to find the right home that checks all the boxes. And that's step two. That's the house hunting phase of the process. Um, I would encourage you to get connected with a realtor. Um, a realtor is going to be an expert in their market. They'll be able to show you homes, help you tour homes, help negotiate your contract, order inspections for your house. Now, I do know, and I'll probably get this question because it's top of mind for a lot of realtors, especially I think we have a realtor in tonight's class. You know, there are changes coming um, effective this weekend with how realtors are compensated for representing buyers. Um, and so that's that's coming out with some of the changes for the National Association of Realtors. Um, I'd encourage you when you do decide to talk with a realtor, have that conversation about that. I'm certainly not an expert in that space, but, you know, um, you know, realtors have a compensation agreement with buyers. So that's something you would definitely want to have a, a, a conversation with during a consultation. Now, when you decide on a realtor, we share with them that pre-approval because ultimately when you decide to make an offer on a house, that realtor will use that pre-approval to submit your offer. Now, let's say if we were to fast forward a little bit and your offer gets accepted. Now, that's called entering escrow. It's generally those similar terminology in different parts of the country, but it's called entering escrow. That means you have a ratified contract with a seller and it begins kind of this escrow time period. Usually it's about 30 days from the time of accepted offer to the time you get your keys to the house. It can be more condensed or a shorter time period in different parts of the country. In fact, in California, some markets, we have a 14 day closing time period if necessary. Uh, but ultimately at step three, you have a ratified contract with a seller. Um, you as a buyer have some action items at that point, like making an earnest money deposit, which usually will be about one to 2% of the purchase price. So if I bought a $500,000 house, my initial investment is $5,000. And what a deposit is, it's a good faith deposit showing the seller that you have an invested interest financially in the transaction. Now, in working with our team, the same day you get your accepted offer, you get a call from me and, and we're going to talk about, you know, first of all, congratulate you because um, it's a big deal to have your accepted offer, but then walk you through next steps in the process, um, give you a sense of what the market looks like, and then get you scheduled for a follow-up video session. So I meet with every client for a 30-minute session to go through their home buying plan now that they're in escrow or kind of revisit the home buying plan. Make sure they understand their interest rates, their out-of-pocket expense, um, their contract timelines, all those important ingredients to their home buying. Now, this, this uh, screen kind of just shows you, again, what the earnest money deposit looks like. Um, it can be varying amounts depending on what's negotiated in your contract with the seller. Now, most contracts across the country have what we call as a contingency period, which allows you as a buyer to do your due diligence or your homework on the property. It's really important, I think, especially for first-time buyers, because this is a new adventure for all of us, right? And so we want to make sure we have added layers of protection in our contract with the seller to do a little bit more homework, like getting the house appraised. Uh, we want to make sure the home is worth what you're buying it for, getting your house inspected, um, getting your loan approved. Usually the contingency timeline will be anywhere between the first 14 to 17 days of the contract period, okay? Um, some buyers elect to not have a contingency. You don't necessarily have to have one, but we strongly encourage it because like I said, it does give you that added layer of protection because if something goes wrong with your inspections, your loan approval or your appraisal, you as a buyer can exit that contract and not risk losing your deposit. Step four in the process is more the administrative side from a lending perspective, the processing and the underwriting of the loan. Um, we're going to verify your employment. Um, we're going to verify assets. We're going to make sure everything is designed properly. Then we will submit everything to an underwriting team who basically issues the loan approval. And that almost takes us to probably two to three weeks in the process. By that time, we have your underwriting approval. We have your appraisal back. And it also takes us to the end of that contingency timeline. So if you're feeling good about the house still, then you can elect to sign off on your contingencies, which tells the seller you've done that due diligence and yeah, you feel good about the property and want to continue. Um, at that point, we're as a lender, we're going to issue to you some final disclosures. Now you receive disclosures all throughout the process. Um, there's different iterations of disclosures, but at the very end of step five, you get what we call a, a closing disclosure. And it does give you a three-day cooling off period before we get to the final milestone. And that's called closing the loan. 
And the closing the loan is the one kind of in-person thing that you will have to do aside from getting your keys and going out and checking out homes. But everything throughout the process is generally done electronically. But at step six, you have to meet with either the escrow team, an attorney, or a public notary, depending on the state you're in, to sign your final loan documents. Usually on that date, you're going to wire in your final funds that are owed to purchase your home. As a lender, we do a final audit of everything. And then once that's completed, we also wire in your funds for your financing, right? So you combine your funds out of pocket, down payment, closing costs, along with your mortgage funds. And that is used, of course, to purchase the home. An escrow team or attorney's office will make sure all those funds are reconciled and then record documents with the local county, which they'll record a grant deed to transfer ownership to you, as well as the deed for the loan. So that basically says, hey, I'm going to pay back this loan, right? And after all those things are confirmed with the county, then I get a chance to make my favorite call, which I've done a few times today already, is calling to congratulate our buyers that now they're official homeowners. It's the best part of my day because um, it's a huge celebration, right? And most of our clients have started in a class just like you had this evening. They've gotten pre-approved. They've gone out and find a home. They've gone in through the escrow process. And then we get a chance to celebrate with them at the finish line. Um, this is one going to be one of the biggest financial goals that you achieve, right? And taking the time out of a busy Wednesday night to join a class like this, hopefully is going to equip you with the tools and resources that you need towards home ownership. And we want to be that partner with you. And so that's why we encourage you to get connected with us for a consultation. We have all of our links here, which includes, it's a really it, a simple process, includes completing an online application. We only do a soft credit check, which I mentioned earlier. You can upload your proof of income assets, either desktop or through mobile. Um, and then you schedule a consultation with us. And all the links are here. The consultation is a one-on-one -on -one with me. That's a 30-minute session that I do with every homeowner across the country um, to design a home buying plan for you. And you don't have to feel like you're going to run out and buy a house this weekend. <laughs> Most don't. You might even not even buy a house this year, and that's totally okay because we want to be a con con uh, basically a consultant with you to help you on that path towards home ownership. Here's what the consultation looks like. We're going to look at you know affordability for you, like where do you want to buy? What's the price point look like? Do we need to improve some things around credit? Do we need to, to install a savings plan? Will some first-time buyer benefits work for you? Um, and kind of come out of that meeting with just a roadmap for you. And um, like I said, that's just a, a service that we provide that is a free service um, as part of a partner for you in this journey. Uh, we have some other resources available through, through mobile. Um, we have the APM mobile app. Um, as part of our edge services for clients. And so you can do calculations on mobile. You can start your application process on mobile. You can even you know, follow the progress with push notifications of your financing. We really try to embrace technology in our world because you know, most people are on their, on their mobile devices all the time, right? So when you're purchasing and making a large investment like a home, you wanna be able to have information readily available to you. And we're proud of our, our partnership, obviously, with the Association of Former Students with a and uh, And we do have other partnerships across the country, um, you know, and we love our partnership with the association. But if you have friends or family, coworkers um, that have attended some of our other partner schools, they're always welcome to attend these free classes. Um, and, you know, whether they've attended a class in the past, maybe and want to do a little tune up, that's totally OK. Um, but we would try to make this stuff always available to our local communities to support home ownership. And again, this will be all up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So you guys can do a look back if you want to or share the links with some of your, your friends and family and coworkers. Um, here's all my contact information. So um, if you have questions after tonight's class, I'm going to take questions in just a bit. But, you know, you have all my information here. And, you know, we have a lot of great, I think, information on our social channels. We're not trying to put just random information out there, but we're trying to put value information um, so I encourage you to follow us on our Instagram at jmata mortgage. So it's J M A T A mortgage, um, and kind of check out what people our client our clients are saying about us in our local communities. All right. Well, I try to get you to the top of the hour and get you all the content, but I do want to carve out some time for questions. Um, and so um, I'm going to go ahead and take questions in Q and A and chat. I know Ken's typing away over there too, trying to get the group our answers, but I'm going to try to take some questions um, and I'll try to stay on, I'll stay online as long as you guys need me to answer those questions. So, um, so I think the first question um, I'll take here, um, how do we, um, uh, so the question is, how do we best utilize having someone price or assess the house? Well, 
I think that would first start with a realtor because they'll do some comparable analysis to see what homes are selling, like homes are selling in the community. Now, if you proceed with the home with an accepted offer as a lender, then we order the appraisal. So if I didn't make that clear earlier, so we order the appraisal on the house and establish a value that gets returned to us from the appraiser. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, and then we'll take that one offline. I got a, I got a, we've got a, a special request, so we'll do that one. Um, and then question on a VA loan: Do both signers have to be veterans for a VA loan? And the answer is no. Um, however, marital status can impact the VA eligibility or the guarantee on the VA loan. So that's something we want to kind of talk a little bit out, offline for you. Um, uh, any interest rates dependent on loan type at all? Uh, absolutely, yes. So FHA rates could look different than conventional rates or jumbo rates. Um, those are things we'll discover as we go through a consultation for you. Um, so there's a question about USDA, which is um, what are the qualifications for a USDA loan? So for USDA, it's a minimum credit score of 620. Um, there's two major qualifications for USDA. Um, that is income. So depending on where the property is located, there's an income limit, but that's by household. There's also a geogra geographical restriction. So it depends on, it has to be located in a USDA um, deemed rural area. And if you have a particular area in mind, we can look that up for you. That's a really simple process. Um, okay. I just want to make sure I'm trying to scroll through some of your questions here. So bear with me. Um, let me, you guys have some great questions. Um, so I think question, I think I talked a little bit about this. Uh, what about building a home versus buying a home? You know, construction financing is still a bit scarce right now. So, you know, I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, there just hasn't been a lot of construction resources available. We're working on a private label APM product. I'll definitely circle back with uh, our group once we know a little bit more about that. Um, so another question, I'm just going to kind of pick some random questions here. How do I know if in the future I will need or want to refinance a mortgage and what interest rates would I want to look for? So refinancing, and let me kind of explain to you what refinancing. Refinance is when you take your current mortgage and we try to refinance it at a lower rate. Um, and when we do that, we want to create a benefit of lowering your monthly payments. So if I bought a home today at 6.5% and mortgage interest rates came down to 5%, well, that's a 1.5% difference. And that should give me a substantial lowering in my monthly payment. I always want clients to have a good break even in refinancing. And here's what I mean by that. Refinancing doesn't, it's not a no cost option. There will be cost involved with a refinance. Usually refinancing costs about $3,000 depending on your loan amount. So we at least want clients saving about two to $300 on a monthly basis. And how we achieve that by is by a reduction in interest rate. So, you know, clients that are buying in today's market, it, given kind of the trends in market, we'll probably see refinancing making a little bit more sense as we get into 2025 and 2026. Um, so question, how does buying a house under a living trust affect the process? Doesn't really change the process. The contract, um, with the seller can still be writ written in the trust name. We can lend in the trust name. However, we have to verify that the trust is an irrevocable trust. Um, so it, we, there's a trust review process. Um, if you're deciding to purchase in your trust, thanks for that. Um, and then how long should we plan to live in a home um, to make buying worth it? I think everybody's situation is a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I think personally, I'd probably want to be in that home two or three years to have a decent recoup. Um, but keep in mind, as a first time buyer, this is probably going to be the launch pad into another home. You know, I had a client that I met with today that purchased a home in Richmond, California, three years ago, for, uh, and now their family's growing, right? And so now they said, hey, wow, I've got this much equity. I want to now make that equity um, into my next house, my second home. So I think everybody's situation is a little bit different. But, you know, I think for first time buyers, this isn't probably going to be your forever home. So I think it could be the kind of the, the launching into the second or third purchase. All right. Okay. I'm still whittling through questions. So um, thanks for that. 
And can I appreciate you helping me out there? Um, okay, let me just see if I missed anything and then we'll, and if I, if I missed your question, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. You got all my contact information. Um, and then I have a question that came in that they do contract work through a union with a schedule four month on and off. How does that affect my two month pay history for pre-approval? So that would be what we call is like seasonal employment. So usually seasonal employment gets averaged two years. So, um, you know, for your question here, you know, we can take that offline a little bit, but um, I like kind of like to see how long you've been in the union because um, with that seasonal employment, we would just average the employment for the last two years. Right. Okay. Um, I think we got, I think we got most of the questions, but let me just do a quick scroll here. I know. Um, okay. Okay. I think we got to most of them. And I know because we have such a large audience, if I miss something, um, we'll kind of go back through our notes and make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, I do appreciate everyone's attendance tonight. You guys have been a wonderful audience. I really do hope I get a chance to connect with each and every one of you to kind of build your own home buying plan. Um, you have all my contact information here. Feel free to schedule an appointment with us uh, for that consultation. Or if you just have some questions and you want to just kind of, you now I know we had some very specific questions in tonight's class, but you know, if you want us to kind of, you know, have that one-on-one -on -one with you, go ahead and use our scheduling system. Our follow-up to you, we'll get you the, the presentation out tomorrow morning. We'll have that up on our YouTube channel and uh, we'll hopefully get a chance to get connected with everyone. Have a good afternoon or evening, wherever you're at, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Good night.